uh, I just realized that some of the code I have code copy and pasted, but I've been too small, so I'm enlarging it. Um, but it should be all good, hopefully. Uh, thank you, and welcome. Uh, my name is Mustafa Hassan. Um, and today, I will try and hopefully show you that real-time event dashboards are sort of easy to build. Um, this will involve some JavaScript, some Ruby, mostly witchcraft. Um, who am I? I am an infrastructure engineer and developer at Pillar. Uh, it's a small startup. Uh, we are based in cosmopolitan Cran, full of overpriced coffee, braided beards, and occasional stabbings. Uh, I am a very reluctant JavaScript code maintainer. Very, very reluctant. Um, I also copy code a lot, uh, which is what usually keeps me in the job, really, when you think about it. Uh, what is filler? Quick intro and plug. Uh, we are an autofill app for your mobile, both Android and iOS. We are very good at filling web forms. Please try us out. Feedback is welcome if it's good. Otherwise, no. Um, get into all feedback. Uh, so what's happening now? Uh, dashboards, they're good, also known as visualizations. If you call dashboards visualizations, congratulations on being your project manager. Um, real time, uh, there's also unreal time, in which, which is like, you know, next day. Um, usually that's the one you can get. Um, and hopefully, at the end of this, uh, you will realize it's not that hard. Um, you will know where to start looking, because it took me a while to sort of get to that point where I saw something and I'm like, ah, oh, this is cool, I should totally do this. And two weeks later, I'm like, this is cool, I should totally do this, because I don't know where to start. And for many users, now the last one seems obvious to you guys. Um, to me it wasn't, because all I cared about was myself and that one TV we have in our office. Um, why did I do this? <laughs> um, we are a startup, so we take other people's money. Uh, and one of the people who gave us money uh, went to another place to meet with other people who have money. And um, they basically saw this massive TV with this thing running, and he found it really cool. And he was like, wow, this is really cool. And he showed it to our CEO, who was like, ah, oh, this is really cool, who showed it to me. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, so why did I do this? In all honesty, because it looks cool. No other reason. At the end of this, you'll realize that chances are it has very little use. Uh, but on a personal note, I learned some stuff. I actually found out about things I possibly would never have found out about. Um, I learned half of it, possibly badly. Um, if a pager duty alert goes off in the middle of this presentation, you will know why. Um, so, uh, I'll just quickly cut away from the presentation to show you guys what site the investors saw. Now, you guys may have seen this before, um, uh, in which case, have a look at it again because it's really nice. Um, it's me only. So, let's go. Right, come back. It's like Chrome knows I'm about to do a demo and it refuses to do that. Okay, uh, which way are you? That. Is that Star Wars? <laughs> it's much worse. It's um, <laughs> this is a company called Norscope that um, sort of specializes in online security, and what you're basically seeing is what they say is real time attacks on honeypot servers. So the destination of the ping is a honeypot server that they have, they say, blatantly left open to attack to sort of see where attacks are coming from. And the source of the ping is what they say the attack is coming from. So if you keep this up somewhere on your computer, every now and then you will see attack from a mysterious eastern company and country um, to every other place in the world. Uh, most of them going to the east coast of US and west coast of US, surprisingly. It's New York, right? Um, nobody attacks Australia. 
<laughs> it's, 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 um, even during the census, nobody attacked Australia. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll uh, close this. And so that was the site that our investor had seen in one company somewhere. Um, now you now you understand why I said no. Um, so. Um, how did I start? At, so this was about six, seven months ago when the um, aforementioned investor came back to our office, had a chat, and conversation flowed through to me that you know there's this website that some guy has built annoyingly, and now I possibly might have to build. Um, so how did I start? Essentially, I, how, did I, how do I build a Google map is how I started, in Google. Um, then I'm like, oh, maybe this is as simple as how do I get Norse map source code? <laughs> <laughs> like, I was hoping for like uh, the first search result being something .js. It was like, I'll just copy that and be done. Um, I did Google please help, um, <laughs> just curiously. I was so desperate at one point that I actually went to the second page of Google search results. <laughs> I have not been there in a long time. So, after. I don't know, a day? This was a Saturday, um, because Saturday. Um, and I thought, oh, cool. Who needs Norse maps? Who needs, yeah, I'll do it myself. Screw you, Norse map. Um, previously, I had had some experience with high maps. It's a JavaScript library. It's really nice. Um, allows you to manipulate maps and data on maps. Um, so I thought, oh, cool. I, I know high maps. I'll start with it. Um, I thought, oh, cool. So the idea is, for me, was we have people using our apps around the world. I just want to show that live. So I managed to put some sort of uh, real-time data into a queue uh, in Amazon. And I thought, oh, cool. I'll, I'll just you know, use the AWS JS SDK uh, to sort of inter to communicate with the queue and then put it on the uh, page. I wrote bad JavaScript. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know, there's a chapter in the Bible against it, but it was bad. Um, why was it bad? Because um, it sort of worked, and I still don't know why it sort of worked. <laughs> um, um, but so I started with that. So what I ended up with was a world map and bubbles popping everywhere. Now, in the previous the Norse map um, show, you, you actually saw a transaction sort of happening from a source to a destination. All I could manage in high maps was the destination. So you had these, uh, it looked like the world was getting measles. <laughs> That's what it looked like, like red, blue, blue, red, blue. Uh, it looked like an anti-vaxxer advertisement. Um, but that's what it was. It looked OK. Updates were basically bubbles. And I wanted to sort of show at the bottom of the map an illustration of what was happening. Like, you know, oh, this is the most um, used city. Uh, this is the city that's using our app the most, and so on and so forth. And uh, live updates in that manner, alongside with map updates, were becoming clunky. Dem as the rate of data increased onto the maps. Now, it is completely possible that it was my JavaScript that did that. It is complete. If anybody here is from high maps, I am sorry I did that to you. But it is quite also possible that high maps is meant for passive updates rather than real updates, real time updates. Um, so, uh, what did I do? I, I drank a lot of coffee. Uh, and then I thought, okay, cool. I actually looked up, if you um, look up the, um, if, you go, if you go to that uh, map.norscope.com and look up the source code of the web page, the comments are amazing. Because um, I'm pretty sure at some point the guy has cried, if you read the comments. Um, he goes, um, there's a comment there going, hacker to satisfy a jerk. Uh, there goes, I don't know why this works. Um, there was some really, really, amazing JavaScript in there. I'm not even sure it's JavaScript. 
I mean, if you just click your heels together while reading that, you can end up somewhere else in the world. Uh, so what did I do? Thankfully, I found a library called Datamaps. Now, both that Norskov map and this library, Datamaps, are built on something called D3.js. A show of hands, who knows what D3.js is? I hate you guys. Go away. Um, so I didn't know what this was. Uh, essentially, it is a it is the C of DOM manipulation. So you know how C gives you an ax and tells you, I don't know what you want to do with it. Go cut a tree or cut your own foot. I don't care. That's what that is. It essentially binds data to the DOM and allows you to change the DOM based on changes in data. And it's really nice. It's really complicated, uh, but it's really nice. Uh, this, one's, this library was solely for maps. Now, D3 possibly allows you to, I don't know, change the parliament. That's how many functions it has. It, if you look at the example site for D3.js, it takes a while for that page to load. Uh, and it has some ridiculous examples. Um, and what was, what, so what was convenient about data maps was it was solely focused on maps. So I didn't have to bother around looking for other things. And it has a fair bit of more functionality compared to high maps, including, for example, if you are familiar with uh, D3, you can sort of plug in some low-level D3 functionality into data maps and get stuff going. So what did I do? I wasn't going to learn D3, because that requires effort. So I basically said, I'll just use data maps, and I put a map. That's five lines of JavaScript, which I didn't manage to screw up. And it, there was a map. <laughs> Um, then I said, uh, that's actually a similar map. That's actually from their um, uh, documentation. You can also put, so something similar was what I achieved on HiMaps. But these are configurable. So essentially, that event of putting a bubble there is configurable. It's configurable opacity, color, size increase, decrease, take away from the map. So there's a bit more uh, 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 sort of feel of be, it being dynamic. Um, so what did I do? Remember how I said, so there was an instance which had the data, I put that data into an SQS queue, and uh, I lovingly called my laptop a map server as it pulled the data from the SQS server. And so what did I do? Um, map in an index.html file, um, data using AWS uh, JS SDK, and this wonderful JavaScript function called set interval, which allows you to you know, poll something every so on seconds. It's like, fine, I don't want anything that does actual real time. Let's just use hackery. Can you even use hackery in JavaScript? Isn't that redundant if you're saying JavaScript? I don't know. Did it work? It did. Uh, on my machine. That's all I care about. Um, but there were issues, as you can imagine. Um, so, part of the code looked like this, uh, as you can imagine, because I was just trying to get it to work. I was like, let's just put credentials in the index.html file. Nobody will see it. It'll be fine. <laughs> this will work. And this was the, um, so that obvious problem, authentication, at no point should you have to put any auth in any file anywhere. And the second one was, the data is in a queue, and I have this one file that's being served by a server pulling data from the queue. Now, if somebody else wants to watch this, that means they will pull some data from the queue while I'll put some data from the queue. And they will get some events, I'll get some events. So there was, it wasn't real time, it was sort of real time. Uh, so, first problem was authentication. Um, again, I did not want to spend any more time in JavaScript than I had to. Uh, lots of visa reasons. Um, so what did I do? I looked up the documentation, and there's this thing called Cognito that allows you to sort of have a user pool, authentic set up authentication on AWS, set up an identity provider of some sort, and go, hey, here's my token. Give me auth and what it can do. Don't be fooled by Cognito. It's not as simple as it looks. 
it, it's weird, very weird. It's like they've said, oh, look, it's easy. No, it's not. And they sort of, that's how you, they're trying to get you to use Cognito by making other things unsafe. And, and I, at this point, I'm like, screw this. I'll just run this on the dashboard in the office. That's the only thing that will ever get this. It'll work. Fine. Nobody will get this. And if, I thought if anybody asked me, hey, can I you know, show this to some other people, I would just say security issues. And <laughs> can't. Some NDA. Um, and the other issue was you know, multi-users. Um, even inside the office, if somebody wanted to see it on their own laptop, they wouldn't get all the events. So what did I do? Thankfully, one thing led to the other. One thing solved the other. Uh, but first things first. Uh, I thought, okay, cool. I'm not going to solve the auth issue anytime soon. So let's just make it work for people in the office and you know, allow a lot more people than just me to have a look at it. Um, WebSockets. Um, yeah, they're nice. It's like hugging a practice. I had had some experience with WebSockets before in that I had seen code with WebSockets in them. And I sort of knew what you could do with it. Um, anybody not familiar with WebSockets is basically a way for the client to talk to the server by themselves, not just the server to talk to the client. So think of it this way. Usually, if you have something on a web page, and that web page gets updated on the server, in order to get that change on the page, you have to refresh the server. So you have to do something for the client to go to the server and go, hey, get me something new, and I'll show it. WebSockets is a way of going, the client automatically, the server tells the client, I've got something, update yourself. Or the client can tell the server, send me something, I'll update myself. So it's bi-directional. And the usefulness of this is, if, for example, the server, I have a WebSocket server, and it gets some new data, it can tell the client, here's some new data, put it on yourself. So it would remove the need for that set interval hackery. I looked around, this, is, this, is, this whole project is a testament to my Googling skills. Um, event Machine WebSocket is a Ruby library that allows you to run Event Machine events and set up a WebSocket server. And JavaScript has a native WebSocket implementation in it. So I thought, nah, I'll just use that. Enough examples were available for uh, event machine WebSockets for me to try. And at the start, I just went, okay, let's see if this works. Uh, set up an event machine loop, run a WebSocket, set up on open. So on open is basically when the connection opens. You have other events like close and error. And basically I thought, oh, cool, in the on open, when it opens the connection with the client, I'll just start pulling the queue and start sending the message to the client. Um, sort of worked, like almost all of my code, but there were a few issues that I couldn't get away with in that the client would automatically disconnect after a random amount of times. I still don't know why. Um, it did cause me a fair amount of heartburn, but at the end, I just realized that um, I was like, cool, let me just, yeah, it sort of works. This whole project is a whole degrading level of sort of works. Uh, I thought, oh, cool, that's fine. But now, because I had this, essentially a Ruby file running, a consumer running, and the act of polling the queue wasn't in the client, I could basically assign permissions to the machine rather than to the client. So in the end, I just ended up setting a very simple role to the, and gave it to the machine. And then I didn't have to do any of the permissions hackery inside the client itself. So that somewhat solved the um, authentication issue inside the code itself. Um, the timeout. Every now and then things would just time out, as I said. And then they would reconnect. But in between the connect and that, the consumer had pulled some data on that wasn't sent to the client. So I was losing data. And that's when I sort of said, oh, how I move forward? Yes. Um, that's when I said, um, screw this. Let's just, imp let's just keep the client and server talking all the time. They don't have much any anything else to do. So it's called ping pong. Some call it heartbeat. So essentially, it's like every set amount of time, the client sends a message to the server. And then the server sends another message to the client. And they just keep talking all the time. 
And in between, if a real message comes, the client shows it. But in the end, they just keep talking until they can't talk anymore. Uh, another thing is, in this, the uh, WebSocket host is, I had set it to 0 0.0.0.0, because I was really clever, and I thought, oh, that'll work everywhere. Uh, no. Same here, like, this, uh, this is on the client side. Uh, look at the beauty that is my JavaScript code. Look at it. It is production ready from day one. Um, the server here, again, is 0 0.0.0.0. Because I thought, yeah, I want localhost. Yeah, I'm way past that. But wait, there's more. So I thought, oh, cool. I'll just put it on a micro instance and run it there and route, route 53 to the public IP. And then everybody can see it from wherever the hell they want to see it. Uh, see that 0.0.0.0? .0 I forgot that's in the client. And if you run it on your machine, it's looking for that server on your machine. I'm like, no, stop doing this to me. And at this point, I, that was the extent of my WebSocket knowledge. Beyond this, I had no way of, like, I was like, screw this. Uh, but then I went, surely this is a problem that the original cool map had. So I just went to that map, opened up Inspector, looked up network, and saw their WebSocket connection. And in there, it actually had like a full domain name, but with a different endpoint. So what they were, I think they were doing is, you have one HTTP endpoint to end up on the map, but from there, the WebSocket client actually goes to another endpoint on the same domain name. And there's a <laughs> server on the other end redirecting it to the WebSocket server. So I used up all of my Nginx knowledge. So this is the HTTP block, where you end up, for example, let's say it's live.devops.com, would end up there. But on the client side, you point it to live.devops.com slash socket cluster. And it goes to the EC2 machine and actually sends it to the WebSocket server. So all the clients talk to the correct WebSocket server remotely. I was really proud of myself when I got that working. It was a great day. Huh. But did it work? This is the sort of nervous part where I actually try and show you guys a demo. Oh, wait, come back here. Ah. Hang on. So, map bottomless. This? Yes. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, so, in the end, this is what I created. The map outline is a bit faint. There. That's a real time, that's a fill that has just happened. Uh, but I could have had pre made data, so let me try and do a fill using our app and see if that works. So I am going to a website called Donate Me, oh, sorry, GoFundMe, and I'm, it, it feels cruel cool because I've been using this test site a lot, and I've been filling the Donate Now button, but without pressing, you know, send. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see that, and so there. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Zero. Uh, <laughs> so that's actually happening now. So I've edited a lot of things for this demo, obviously. There's a lot more info here, basically. So for example, what as filler, let me just, again, make it clear on a serious note. At no point do we have any user data at all. It's not like we, we get it and then we discard it, or we get it and we don't store it. We don't get it at all. When you fill a form, all we know is user X, we don't know who X is, filled GoFundMe, and he filled first name. What he filled it with, we never get. What he, uh, if, uh, for example, um, at no point do we get any data. So what we're showing here is basically, oh, this is the most used site for today. This is, a uh, the most used, uh, the city that's been using filler the most today. 
agreed. Um, and so, so there's a lot of data here as well. And again, again, as I said, for this has no functional use to us as a startup, other than uh, when investors walk in and there's a, do you guys know what a drop is in terms of retail? The context is retail. So there are, um, for example, think um, aggregators, but for retail. There are sweepstakes and so on and so forth. But there's a site called um, Supreme New York. They have their own brand of clothing as well, but they also accumulate like Nike and Adidas. And every third or fourth Thursday, they have like a sale, a massive sale. And what happens is you are not guaranteed an item even if you put it in your cart. Because by the time you go and fill in your details, somebody has actually bought it. And we get used a lot there because there's no typing involved. So I have this, I think I have this video of, at the moment it looks really slow, because it is. But um, let me see if I can find it. We took a video of one of the drops, because we find out beforehand, because uh, we have other set of data, and we know oh, every Thursday there's a spike in our usage. So come next Thursday, we keep an eye on it. And uh, let me see if I can. So that was us taking a video. That's a drop happening on Thursday morning. As you can see, the event. there's a lot more data, but that's real time. Um, it is, um, most of our usage is in US, so late night, 3 AM. Um, we send this link to our investors and go have a look at the usage. Um, we identified, I mean, quite by accident. Um, so we use latency-based routing to, we have, as you can see, the source is, we have three stacks, Singapore, Oregon, and Frankfurt. So request from here gets served by Singapore, uh, in the Europe it gets served by Frankfurt, US gets served by Oregon. Every now and then, because we use latency-based routing in Route 53, every now and then, we see this massive line from here to here, or here to here. And that's Amazon screwing with us. Uh, yeah. But that is the demo. Hang on. Let me go back. Wait. Here. So yeah. That is all. Thank you. Are there any questions? No? Okay, thanks. <laughs> I know the diagram you just showed before that. Would it be any different if you make some donation? Sorry? The diagram you just showed before The diagram, sorry. Yeah. This one? Sorry, diagram. Which one? one? The movement, the graph, the map. My question is that. Oh, the demo, sorry, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Would it make any difference if you make some donation? Would it result in anything different <laughs> if you make some donation? To who? Whichever I'll happily take your money, <laughs> like at, all the time. So we are a startup. Anybody's money is fine. Um, any other questions? No. Hey. What do you use as your uh, like source to say where they come from? Uh, forwarded IP. Actually, I don't like it. Really. Is, uh, sorry. How do you how do you associate with the country? Uh, we use uh, GeoCoder. Uh, the library geocoder to translate IPs into landmarks. Yeah, that's it. We don't get the phone's IP at all. Uh, this is the nearest tower or um, the uh, LTE IP that we get. <laughs> As part of this, I wrote something to clean the, uh, this is just an anecdote, uh, to clean the instances I was creating. We call it the Hillary Clinton email, Dr. Arby. <laughs> That's... Thank you. Thank you.